So first, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's a pleasure to see so many friendly faces. And thank you all for tuning in online, whoever is there, because I can't see you. Um, we'll have a bit of fun with this. So I'll take you on a tour of, as Sue alluded to, about five years worth of research, and I'll try to weave it into a coherent story. So here in Texas, we are, of course, no strangers to subsurface potential, right? January 10th, 1901, Spindletop, right? Kicked off the oil age in Texas. And within two years, one derrick was replaced by a forest. Two years. And of course, oil has been an amazing gift to not only Texas, but to humanity. It's been heat, light, mobility. It's lifted billions from poverty. It's fueled the information age, and it continues to. However, we have a new problem. And that, of course, is too much of a good thing. It's dealing with the emissions. CCS, carbon capture and storage, is one part of that solution. But slow to get going, fair to say. So when I joined the Carbon Center in 2019, as Sue said, the landscape of CCS on the Gulf Coast was this. It was CO2 EOR. Lots of projects, the world's biggest pipeline for CO2, but no dedicated saline storage projects. At the time, the credit for CO2, the tax credit, which is how we fund it in this country, uh, was $50 a ton, newly raised from, 40, from $10 a ton. Right? And $50 a ton was enough to get people working around and going, ooh, what could I do here? The equivalent to Spindletop in CCS is this, is the passage of the IRA, the Inflation Reduction Act which raised the tax credit from $50 a ton, which is just barely up from 10, to $85 a ton. And that has kicked off the age of CCS in Texas on the Gulf Coast. So these, this is a map um, already out of date, two months, three months later, um, of CCS projects on the Gulf Coast. So the dark blue are ones that have announced a capacity and they are scaled, the size of the dots is scaled by capacity. The light blue are ones that have announced a rate. And if I infer, if I guess a 20 year project life, which is typical, we can infer a capacity. The white ones are ones that have announced neither capacity nor rate. But if you count them all up, there are about 50 projects in motion on the Gulf Coast with leases, with drilling wells, with permits on file. Um, companies are committing actual money to this. In total, those 35 that have announced rates or uh, capacities would inject about 300 million tons per year and claim a total of seven gigatons of storage. Make no mistake, there is a new gold rush on and there is serious money going into this. We're seeing, these are just a sample of headlines over the last few months, but we're seeing mergers, we're seeing announcements of new hubs, we're seeing serious investment, half a billion dollars from BlackRock, $7 billion from Air Products, um, nor is it restricted to the Gulf Coast, uh, $6.5 billion in Alberta, $17 billion in UAE. All right. We have a lot of experience with CCS or with carbon, carbon dioxide handling and injection. This goes back 50 years to 1972 when the first CO2 EOR projects in West Texas Right? There's tens of historic projects and ongoing projects. And this map gives you a 2020 view of what that looked like. They're all over the world in lots of different reservoirs. And they've injected a cumulative total of about a gigaton. The challenge is that we have to do that every year if we're going to make a dent in climate change. We need to get CCS to gigaton per year scale. Which brings me to subsurface. How do you do this, right? What is the play for carbon storage? And of those 65 or so projects I showed you on the last map, they have all used what are basically variations on two plays. One is the depleted field. And the, one, the image on the left shows you Loch Roos, which is a total pilot project in the south of France. Um, it is hydrocarbon geology. It is a depleted field, same reservoir, same seal, same trap we use for CO2. Fine. The other one, Sleipner, is a dedicated saline storage project that's been running since 1996 in the North Sea. Um, 
and it uses a shallow reservoir, a shallow sand, underneath a high quality regional seal. So it's basically a petroleum reservoir, petroleum seal, um, just without the trap. And you can see the logs there. It's a beautiful blocky sand, Darcy scale permeability, regional marine shale on top, right? These things work, but they're clearly heavily influenced by petroleum production. And CCS, our goal is sequestration, not production, which makes you wonder, is there a better way? How would we explore for storage on industrial scale? And that is the question that I will address. So we will focus on the Gulf Coast because A, we are Gulf Coast Carbon Center, but B, uh, more relevant for this talk, we get a chance on the Gulf Coast to look over the horizon in a sense, to see what a fully built up CCS industry might look like. And I say this because A, we've got world-class subsurface data on the Gulf Coast, right? We know, and we, of course, we have a hundred years of hydrocarbon production now. We know a lot about the subsurface and about how these reservoirs perform. We also have lots of emissions. So the map on the left is showing you wells, 1.1 million of them, and in yellow, the emissions. Again, the dots are scaled by yearly emissions volume. The big ones are about 10 million tons. And in total, Texas and Louisiana have about 500 million tons per year of point source CO2 emissions. There's a lot of, a lot of emissions and a lot of variety in those emissions. Uh, the map on the, the other side is the one I just showed you, of course, map of Gulf Coast projects. And it is already a crowded landscape, right? There is competition and we get to look at how do you juggle lots of competing subsurface uses? So the first part of this presentation, where's the good storage, right? Where do you wanna be? How do you give assurance to investors? How do you pick where you wanna play? And we can learn something from petroleum in this, right? Petroleum, we have a very well-developed workflow for deciding what basins and where in the basin we wanna be. Um, play-based exploration or common risk segment mapping, as it was called in BP. And it's a five-step process. We define the play elements. So we break the success factors in, or the ingredients for success into individual factors and for petroleum, source presence, charge access, and so on. Um, we map whatever facts we can. And of course, you'd love to map um, actual source presence, total organic carbon or something like that, right? Very rarely can we do that on exploration data. We just don't have the, the resolution to do it. So we map proxies. In this case, we map usually depositional environments and we can, or depth, depth of a particular horizon. We can then define minimum requirements. What do we need out of this? How much organic content? What kind of thermal maturity? What's our minimum permeability? All of those things. And we can make we can translate the facts into a relative chance of success, right? So the muddy, to take one example, if you're looking at source presence, the marine shale there in brown has a high chance of being a successful source rock, right? And where it's buried deeply under charge access, we would infer either <laughs> perfect maturity in the green or marginal maturity in the yellow immature in the red, so on, right? So we can create a series of individual maps of chance of success, and we can add those together into a composite map, right? Different rules for how you add them. In BP, it had to be all greens on the input maps creates a green on the output map. Um, doesn't matter. Any, any red or any yellow on any of the input maps turns it red or yellow on the final. But this is a powerful technique. Right? It really, it takes complex geologic analysis and translates it into easily understood, clear business inputs that you can comprehend at a glance. Right? And of course, you know, if you're, you've got a nice prospect and it sits in the red or the yellow on this, it encourages you to go back and ask which layer turned that red or yellow and how well constrained is that, right? We could do the same thing for CCS. Um, obviously, there are fewer play elements. We don't care about source presence. We don't care about charge access. Um, so we focus on reservoir presence, reservoir quality, and seal capacity. But 
CCS is a different beast, right? Exploration risk is low. We think we can make this work pretty much anywhere that we have sufficient sedimentary section at some scale. And it's highly project dependent. So the two images you see there, on the top is Boundary Dam, a coal-fired power plant that spits out on the order of 10 megatons per year. If you're going to sequester those emissions, you need a pretty high quality reservoir with a lot of injectivity, a lot of capacity. On the other hand, the bottom one is Climeworks. It's a direct air capture unit that spits out maybe 10,000 tons a year. That could use a much lower quality reservoir, much smaller capacity. So success is not just simply oil, bigger is better, find the big barrels and we'll get them to market. It's, it starts with the emission source and it needs to be good enough for that emission source. So this absolute standard that we use in CRS mapping of bigger is better, find me the lowest risk, it's hard to apply as is to CCS. The other thing, of course, is that CCS is a new science um, and new industry. We are very likely to be showing these maps to public and to regulators going, look, you know, this is why we chose this area. If you put it in terms of risk, it sounds like safety, and that's really worrisome. Um, red on those maps you know, is a great way of screening out lots of area that you don't want to focus on. But to public, to regulators, it looks like a no-go, right? Not just no chance of success, but whoa, here be dragons. So to adapt this for CCS, fewer play elements, we reframe it in terms of relative cost, which basically means number of wells it's gonna to take to achieve the rate you need. Um, and we add more colors so that we can reserve the use of red for something that really is a no-go. So returning to the Gulf Coast, cross section of the Gulf Coast runs from Dallas, more or less on the left side, down to the deep water, to the Mexico US border on the right. Houston is right there in the middle. Um, and for petroleum, we worry about the entire section. Right? You see the prograding margin, um, Jurassic and blue building out to Cretaceous and green and so on, complicated by mobile salt and pink. I used to spend weeks drawing these cross sections in, in my previous, previous career, worrying about crustal structure and what it implied for heat flow and source distribution. For CCS, we are focused on a pressure window, a fairly narrow pressure window that is defined at the top by the minimum pressure to keep CO2 supercritical, so dense, um, making good use of pore space. And on the bottom, we're limited by overpressure, where we run out of pressure headroom to inject more stuff. So we focus on a pretty narrow interval. And I say narrow, it's narrow in a relative sense. Um, the deepest parts of that are about five kilometers depth, which gives you a solid four kilometers plus of section to work with. But you will notice that because we have a roughly tabular window intersecting with dipping per grading margin, um, the stratigraphy of interest varies depending on the geography. Right? So up dip, we're focused on Jurassic and Cretaceous. Down dip, we're looking at Miocene, even Pliocene. So in map view, that creates these overlapping arcuate segments of differing stratigraphy. And wherever you are, you probably have two of those shingles, maybe not, maybe three at best. Um, and for illustration, I'll focus on the lower Miocene, and I've cut it off at the Louisiana border and at the Texas border, but take the point that it extends. So doing this for CCS, we can map reservoir presence, reservoir quality, seal capacity, and we use the same proxies we'd use in oil, right? Reservoir presence is based on depositional environments. Reservoir quality is on provenance and mineral composition. And seal capacity actually gets interesting. Um, the gray is presence over marine shale, classic. Um, the yellows, I will come back to later in this talk, but they are thick sections of deltaic sediments. No marine shales, but lots of layered uh, barriers. And we think they will work. So we make a judgment about relative cost to characterize and develop and turn those fact maps into relative cost maps, which we add together to create a composite. And you're saying, eh, okay, fine, but is it real? There was a judgment in there, right? We can calibrate those things. So we can look at historic oil production 
and use maximum monthly production rate as a proxy for injectivity. So in this case, red is showing you highest injections or highest production rates um, in excess of 500,000 500, MCF per month. Uh, and you'll notice they cluster in the dark green. Yellow, orange and yellow, a little bit uh, less high quality. And they color in the dark green to light green. The gray are the relative dogs in this, and they tend to be out in the, <clears throat> in the yellow. So, so far so good. We can also use produced volume by well, so trying to get away from the effect of trap size and so on, but looking at per well volumes as a proxy for reservoir presence and for capacity. And again, the highest performing wells cluster where we predicted they would, in the dark green to the light green. So it gives you the sense that we're on the right track. And we can, <laughs> this is unique to CCS, but we can do this for multiple sets of stratigraphy and then add them all together, um, looking for the best storage that's available in any given area. So in this, a dark green on any of the input maps creates a dark green on the output map because you've got high quality storage available. And what you see is that we've got highest, that is the dark green and um, very good, which is the light green, available pretty much everywhere. The yellow fringes on this map are because of that baffled confinement up dip and because we get too deep down dip. And if you included younger and older stratigraphy, I'm pretty sure those would go away. So the point is you've got actually pretty high quality storage wherever you look. This is not the limiting factor. The limiting factor, as it turns out, is all the other stuff that's going on, right? We've got 1.1 million legacy wells in the Gulf of Mexico. There's about 60,000 active gas producers, about 70,000 active oil producers, about 10,000 active saltwater disposal wells, about 30 active gas storage sites, one active geothermal well that I know of, and of course, 900,000 or so plugged in abandoned wells. That's the big constraint that we have to work with. Fortunately, those wells are not evenly distributed, right? They're clustered in the fields. So if we zoom in on the Texas-Louisiana border, and you'll see the Sabine River running down the middle of this map, you can see the wells in the black dots, and they are, of course, clustered on the highs. So structural closures on this map are shown by the dark blue outlines. Um, occasionally, there's a bit of salt poking through them at the level of this map. That's pink. Level of the map is uh, lower Miocene. Faults, of course, are the dark, dark lines on the map. And you will notice wells cluster in the structural closures. There's a lot of running room if you go down dip into the white areas. We can get pretty good-sized areas that are actually well-free or almost so. So... We start rethinking how we, how we go about looking for CO2 or for storage, right? So this is a classic Gulf of Mexico cross-section at the field scale. We've got a salt die up here. We've got a bunch of sands in yellow that are thick in the syncline, thin as they come up onto the anticline. Some of them uh, transition into waste zone. That's the dark shading in the one. Um, some of them thin and cross the salt die up here or pinch out on the flanks. And of course, there's a gas accumulation on it. It's Gulf of Mexico um, and some production up there. We could reuse those same reservoirs. We could reuse the wet ones for CO2. It would work. It's fine. But of course, we'd have to worry about the integrity of those wells. On the other hand, our goal is sequestration. So what we'd really like to do is go down the flank and inject close to the syncline, play for migration loss, basically. One man's migration loss is another one's super secure storage. So take advantage of all the residual trapping you can get. Take advantage of dissolution. Take advantage of the little buoyancy, uh, buoyant traps on the way. Um, they might be as small as the roughness on top of a flow unit. They might be things like the, the faults there that are absolutely sub-economic for hydrocarbons, but big enough to trap some CO2, right? Use all of that stuff. And I know what you're thinking. 
in hydrocarbons, you look at that and you go, well, it's all going to the crest anyway. Um, we've done a fair bit of modeling on this, and this is Meliana's thesis work. Um, but it is exploring exactly this scenario. And it's injection in the syncline with an adjacent anticline. So the top two um, panels on this uh, on this slide show you CO2 saturation in the colors at the end of injection. So injecting in the white square down dip, 30 megatons on the left, 60 megatons on the right. And you can see the hot colors are around the well. By the end of injection, we've gotten you know halfway, a little bit more than halfway up to the anticline. The bottom two panels are 100 years post-injection. And you can see the colors have cooled. Right? CO2 is spread out, saturations are lower. But with 60 megatons, we have barely got even a few molecules to the crest of the anticline. This doesn't include dissolution. It's purely residual trapping and local capillary trapping. Migration loss at the scale we're talking for CCS can be really, really significant. So. Where's the storage? Where do we want to be? Focus on the fetch areas. We've got high, widespread, high quality storage across the Gulf of Mexico. Um, what we really care about is getting away from the legacy wells, getting away from the competing uses. And that means focus on the fetch. Fetch areas give you regions of, of course, unified dip and therefore predictable flow. So you know which way the plume is headed. That's useful. They also give you a lot of flexibility about where you put the injector, because about two thirds of this map is fetch area. One third is actual closure. So we've tripled the area under consideration. And of course, we can get away from the legacy wells and play for migration loss with those closures as a backstop if we need it. Which brings me to the second part of this and the role of pressure, because it's not just about CO2. Here's the problem, and I love this picture. I probably use it more than Sue does, and she took it 10, 15 years ago. Um, subsurface pore space is already full, right? It's either got hydrocarbons or more likely brine in it. Injection requires making room for more stuff. Right? We're putting additional fluid into the subsurface, and there are different ways to do that, right? We can raise the land surface, which happens. It's real. We can see it on INSAR, but it's on the, on the scale of centimeters, millimeters, right? It's small. Um, our second bet is to displace pre-existing fluids, which is real. It ha certainly happens. We push the brine away from the well. But it really only creates space if you can displace that fluid to previously unoccupied pore space, ground surface or above the water table. Um, and regulators are going to have, and public, are going to have a lot to say about that if you try it. Um, Dissolution is effectively free space. It's real, but on the time scales of injection, it's pretty limited. Our remaining option, and where most of our storage space comes from, is compression. It's compression of rock and pre-existing brines, neither of which is very compressible. Right? So pressure rise is absolutely inevitable in this, and it is the key limit. So how does this show up? We define a concept, a concept called area of review, and it is based on pressure. So this is a diagram of a CO2 injector on the left, and you see the CO2 plume down at the bottom in blue in a nice little reservoir that is shaded, right? CO2 injection requires displacing water. So there is a pressure buildup around the well, that's the dark shading, and it grades off with distance toward background hydrostatic pressure, where you see just the pure yellow sandstone. The red line at the top shows you the hydraulic head. So that curved red line shows you the hydraulic head in the injection zone. So right next to the well, we have artesian conditions. Right? If we had an open well bore, you'd see a fountain at the surface. Our requirement is not only not to produce fountains, um, but it's to protect fresh water, which is the dark blue at the top. So area of review is defined by a critical pressure, critical pressure buildup at reservoir level that is sufficient to lift dense injection zone brines through a hypothetical open wellbore 
to the level of the lowest fresh water. So where you see that hydraulic head profile cross the bottom of the fresh water, that's the edge of our area of review. Okay, so basically a circular pattern around the well uh, defined by pressure. Here's the requirement. EPA, who permits class six wells in this country, requires you to define the area of review and identify all penetrations, including active and abandoned wells within the AOR, review their construction records, and assure their integrity under increasing pressure. So to keep these projects economic and ri low risk, we need to either review these all these wells, or better yet, keeping them economic, keep the area of review from touching as uh, any well that we can avoid, right? Keep it away from those clusters of uh, pre-existing fields. So if you come back to this map, it's not just a question of fitting the CO2 plume into these blank areas on the map. It's a question of fitting the pressure plumes into those blank areas. So we'll look at a handful of different prospects as a way of exploring how we do this. Prospect one is a large prospect with a fair scattering of legacy wells. And our bet, our strategy here, is going to be to keep the pressure low so that we keep the plume, the AOR, very close to the, our injection well, and we minimize the number that we touch. So open boundaries, we'll try to keep the pressure low. Prospect three, as it comes up on this, um, a bit out of order, is going to be a large prospect, lots of well-free areas down dip, um, but roughly closed boundaries. So if I go back, you'll see that it's basically fault bounded. And we're going to take this as closed boundaries on injection timescales. The other one, which is going to come up as the second one, uh, is to take the strategy of, look, we're going to take a small fault block with only one well in it. We're going to assume those faults are sealing, and that's a different story. We can assure it or not, but assume they are for the sake of argument. We're going to use those as pressure barriers. We'll pressure up that little compartment, but we'll rely on the barriers to keep pressure away from, from the other wells. So looking at the first one, 400 square kilometers, open boundaries. Um, if I use one megapascal as the critical pressure buildup, um, which is typical and appropriate for this reservoir. You can see the pressure plot in the upper, on the upper image. The dashed outline is the edge of the area of review. Right? So it's small, um, less than five kilometers across. We'd have to review a handful of wells, but that would be okay. We can do that. That's with 100 meters of net reservoir, 25% porosity, and 20 megatons of injection. If I reduce the permeability, if I get luck, <laughs> get unlucky and find something with only 20 millidarcies instead of 100, it of course impacts my ability to push water away. It takes more pressure. So the area of review swells. Now we're talking about 10 kilometers in diameter, which is gonna start looking expensive and risky given the number of wells it will encompass. On the other hand, if it's 500 millidarcies, which actually is typical for this area, we can shrink it to nothing. It will be this, the outline of the CO2 plume itself. So open boundaries and high quality reservoir, you look really good. If you take a small isolated fault block and same reservoir parameters, you try to do the same thing. We pressure it all up. The top of that scale bar is 93 megapascals from a starting point of 26. That is so far above any estimation of frac pressure that you know, forget it. Uh -uh. We could try adding more reservoirs. We've got lots of sands in the Gulf. We can add more reservoir intervals. That usually works well. So if we go from 100 meters of net reservoir to 400 meters, we do reduce the pressure buildup. Now the top of the scale is 45 megapascals, which is still above frac pressure. Yeah, <laughs> Julie is looking at me like, no, thank you. Um, forget that scenario. What we can try instead is a smaller CO2 source, less injection, and that, you know, we can keep playing these games. But with half the injection amount and still 400 meters of reservoir, 
we get to something that is probably about at frac pressure, right? Just about tolerable. So if you've got small sources, this kind of strategy would work. Here's where it gets interesting. Prospect three, large prospect, closed boundaries. Uh, with 100 meters of net reservoir and 20 megatons of injection, we pressure up the whole compartment. All 400 square kilometers, every well in it is gonna need review. Mm, not so good. Add more reservoirs, right? Increase the size of the tank. So if we go from 100 meters to 400 meters, everything else is still the same. We can shrink that area of review down to, again, about five kilometers, a little bit less, right? That's a footprint we can fit in lots of spots within that compartment. No problem. We could avoid reviewing a single well. Here's the kicker, though. You notice there's lots of low-pressure area left in this compartment. And you might remember from the map, there was lots of well-free areas. If you have a competitor or even you know, yourself thinking, well, there's room to put another injection project in here. We can explore that. We can put an identical injection project anywhere in that same compartment. And once again, the combination of two injectors, so doubled the injection volume basically, um, put the entire compartment into the area of review. Right? We pressure up the whole thing. So not only does your injection matter, but your neighbors and your competitors matter if it's in hydraulic communication. So essentially, with two projects, we go from this diagram for one project to this kind of diagram with two. And that area in the middle, which was outside the individual area of review for either project, well, of course, there are fringe pressures from both projects in there, and they sum to give you something that is reviewable. Whose area of review is that? Who's responsible? Um, who knows? Law does not cover this. This is the stuff of court fights. Uh, and of course, lost injection and uh, economic haircuts. So key, key message here. We can, of course, define areas, well-free areas. We can find running room in the Gulf for individual projects, but accurately forecasting their performance requires considering not only your own injection, but everyone else's who's in hydraulic communication. So you come back to this map and you look at the number of big dots that are very closely clustered and you start thinking, hang on, can we really put this many projects in close proximity? And that brings me to the question of capacity. How much can we actually put into the Gulf Coast? What is the, what's the running room here? And many of you will recognize this. It's Bureau work from 2017 and the years previously. But there are giant published capacity numbers. So this is a slice of the Texas Gulf Coast, um, looking at the Miocene. And based on effectively oil and gas volumetrics, a pore volume times the saturation times the density, because we talk about CO2 in terms of mass, not volume, but basically oil and gas volumetrics, you would say the Gulf Coast has something on the order of 125 gigatons in the Texas Miocene, right? If you looked at just state waters, it's about 30 gigatons. And that's assuming four and a half percent of the pore space filled with CO2 and a density appropriate for the reservoir depth. It's a pretty standard, in fact, it's a very standard calculation in CCS. But you'll notice it doesn't involve pressure. An injection, as we've just said, it requires displacement of the pre-existing fluids. So where do they go? Out of this somehow, can we actually assume that it has open boundaries, that you can displace the fluids at will? Let's take a look. So this is a cross-section running through Trinity Bay, just outside of Houston, through the Gulf Coast Miocene. Um, the storage window is the shaded region, So, and it's all Miocene. In concept, of course, those sands extend up dip and down dip. But up dip, if we try to displace water, we have fresh water. That's protected by law. We can't go that way. Down dip, we have overpressure. Can't go that way. It's a pressure barrier. In and out of the plane of section, of course, we do have connections along strike. 
but there are faults, there are diapirs, there are straddle pinch outs, and there may be other injection projects creating pressure barriers. Large scale displacement along strike is probably not uh, a reasonable assumption either. Effectively at regional scale, boundaries are probably not open. So what if we pressured it all up? How much do you get? And we can use the same inputs, and thank you, Dave Carr, if you're online, for giving me the grids that went into the static capacity. So I have taken those same grids, rewritten the algorithms to create a pressure-based capacity. Um, so porosity came straight from Dave Carr, thank you. Um, allowable pressure change, I can calculate based on depth from starting hydrostatic up to 90% of frac. Uh, total compressibility, I can calculate based on salinity and porosity, temperature and pressure. Final CO2 density, function of temperature and pressure. And of course, net reservoir thickness. Thank you, Dave Carr. Put those all together, and we have a new view of capacity. And you, same stratigraphy, you go from 125 gigatons to about 10, which is still a lot of storage, but a 90% reduction, holy cow, right? And this is what you get considering pressure. So we've got you know, a lot of storage on the Gulf Coast. This is just Texas Miocene, of course. There's other stratigraphy, down dip, up dip, a long strike. There's a lot, but it's a much more realistic and even still optimistic view of capacity. The average poor occupancy storage efficiency is about 4%. 0.4%, not 4.5%, but 0.4%. Um, I'll be the first to acknowledge there are uncertainties in this, right? Um, I have assumed you can get every, everything to 90% of frac pressure. Utterly ridiculous, not going to happen. It's just an upper limit. And being an explorer, you know, I, I work with uncertainty by trying to bracket ranges. So there you've got about the top of the range. If you can get the non-net reservoir to absorb pressure, and some of it will, right, then you get a bit more. Right? Depends on how much pressure you can bleed into the fine-grained section. Um, that would give you a little more. Dissolution, of course, is effectively free space. To the extent you can get CO2 to dissolve, you'd get a bit more. But of course, getting to 90% of frac pressure everywhere is just not going to happen. right? Um, not only would you have to accept zero injection rate, you'd need a lot of wells and a lot of time, and you'd have to pressure up those existing fields. Uh, so the big swing in this, the big uncertainty is water production. If you can produce water, so balance injection with withdrawal, then you can do this all day. Pressure is no longer your limit. The trouble is that you've got to do something with the water. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Peter is laughing at me. <laughs> you got to do something with the water. Um, Reinjecting it somewhere else just puts the same problem somewhere else. And this calculation says we use every available reservoir for CO2. Um, you really only get out of jail free if you are off offshore and allowed to overboard water, just as we do with oil and gas. If you can do that, sounds great. If you can't, we are pressure limited, which is why we talk about the pressure space. This is Susan, my new concept. It is pressure space, the multiple of pore volume and pressure headroom, right? Pressure space is the absolute key subsurface commodity. Um, the regulations, the leasing requires pore space. The business of injection requires pressure space. Without pressure space, you can't inject. And the implications are, of course, you need to consider not just your own project, but all of the projects in pressure communication, because they're all competing for the same pressure space. Pressure, you know, respect some boundaries, but we need to be clear about what those boundaries are, and they are not lease boundaries. At present, there's a huge first mover advantage, um, and it suggests probably wider project spacing and perhaps temporary lease agreements that um, that cover the pressure, the pressurized reservoir volumes um, with a higher, higher lease for the reservoirs with CO2 in them. So I often use the analogy of a gas storage tank as you know, a way of visualizing the subsurface. 
capacity depends not only on the size of the tank, but also on the pressure rating. Right? You need both of those numbers, and we do for subsurface as well. Which brings me to the last part of this. How do you contain it? It's all well and good to inject it. Helps enormously, but you got to keep it there. And we have on the Gulf Coast, of course, lots of beautiful regional seals. We know they work from petroleum. They've held buoyant fluids for geologic time. So if we come back to the same cross section, there's the storage window. You see all the beautiful sands, nice injectable sands. But there are two regional seals in this view. One is the Anahuac, which is the deep one. It crosses this whole window. The other one is the Amph B, which is the middle one, the top of the lower Miocene. And these things do what marine shales do, right? They thin, they pinch out, up dip, which leaves a lot of this reservoir uncovered by a regional seal. So does that rule it out? Or can we still use it? We know these regional seals work for petroleum. They'll work for CO2, not a problem. But as I keep saying, CCS is not petroleum production. So we are injecting industrial quantities on very limited timescales. It's not geologic volumes. Good source rocks produce hundreds, tens to hundreds of millions of barrels per square kilometer. So they, good petroleum source rocks will overcharge a system. CCS, we're talking about vastly smaller quantities, but going in much, much quicker. The saving grace is that our, our goal is sequestration, not production. Right? We need <clears throat> um, we need CO2 to stay there, and it doesn't need to stay mobile or recoverable. And in fact, it's more secure if it doesn't. Right? If it's immobilized in the reservoir, then I don't really care about seal capacity anymore, because that's not what I'm relying on to keep it there. So it opens the question, is there a better way to do this, or at least another way? And that's what we'll explore in the last bit of this talk. It's a concept called composite confining systems. Thank you again, Sue, for coming up with a, <laughs> a memorable name. Um, but it's the idea that lots of layers and barriers, highly imperfect barriers, could in aggregate create very secure containment. Um, for those who remember Reason's Swiss cheese model of accident prevention, which we saw a lot of during COVID, it's the basis of internet cybersecurity. Um, you see it invoked in modern warfare, defense in depth, as it's called, with lots of uh, imperfect barriers halting an advancing enemy. It's the same idea, lots of imperfect barriers. So in this case, what we're thinking of is a multi-layer system of discontinuous barriers with no a priori requirements for minimum capillary entry pressure, but that in aggregate create very long, tortuous flow paths for vertical migration. And it raises all kinds of questions, right? What is a barrier in the subsurface? What do they actually look like? How much CO2 can they contain? So fortunately, I have some very clever colleagues to collaborate with. So this is a series of sand tanks, that sand tank models that Hyland put together to investigate this question of what constitutes a barrier. So for the uninitiated, these sand tanks are about two centimeters thick so that we can see light shining through them uh, and about 60 centimeters on a side. The one on the left, you see barriers which are made of glass beads, um, fine sand equivalent in size with different shapes, small barriers, different shapes. The background in these models, the light gray is medium sand equivalent. So in context, it's all reservoir, right? We're just looking at small variations in reservoir grain size. The middle tank, of course, you see flat barriers. What you'll struggle to see are graded beds. And we had this idea that perhaps gradation in those barriers, multiple layers between medium sand and pure fine sand might make a difference. So you see in the top layer that you can see a couple of stripes. There's actually four of them. The last model on the right just shows you effectively the effect of really long barriers. But look what happens when we put CO2 or CO2 analog into these things. We bubble it in from the bottom and we'll continue the experiment until we get CO2 out at the top. So you see it doing 
you know, in some ways what you'd expect, ponding under each barrier, spreading out, finding a way around or a way through. And the last, there we go, the last one. So a couple of things to notice in this. You see, particularly in the middle experiment, those graded beds actually don't make much difference. CO2 sees the first reduction in permeability, which is absolutely tiny. It's the difference between medium sand and slightly finer medium sand. And CO2 goes, oh, that's hard work. I'm going this way, right? Very, very small reductions in permeability can create a barrier for flow at buoyancy pressure. The other thing is even highly imperfect barriers trap some CO2, right? Flat barriers, there's no trap to it per se. Uh, they're limited in length, CO2 spills around them, but it leaves molecules behind. So what do these things look like in real systems? Um, it's hard to count reductions in <laughs> variations in sand permeability or sand grain size in real systems. Our logs just don't pick it up. But we can count the difference or see the difference between sands and muds. So we can take a conservative view of real systems by looking at the muds, knowing that the sands are going to be uh, more frequent and with more frequent internal barriers. So this is a bunch of statistics from Southern Louisiana, 200 something wells, uh, and counting mud thicknesses in the middle Miocene and muds per hundred meters. And you can see lots of thin muds, a few really thick ones, kind of as you'd expect. And on average, about seven or eight muds per hundred meters of section. So at least seven or eight barriers for every hundred meters of section. Um, how far they extend is important, and we can't see it without seismic, maybe even with seismic. Um, but what we do have are lots of published field reports. So every one of these field reports, there's three or four page things um, published by the local geological societies, but they include a reservoir map, usually the most productive reservoir. And that includes an oil water contact or hydrocarbon water contact which gives you an absolute minimum extent for the overlying seal. Right? Seal cannot be smaller than the oil water contact. It's probably bigger, uh, but at least it's an estimate. And we can put together statistics, long axis, short axis, and we see that these deltaic shales, nothing, no regional floods among them, um, but even deltaic shales get up to at least nine kilometers in length and half again as wide. Uh, all of these things are structurally controlled. Uh, it's an absolute minimum, both length and aspect ratio. But you start to assemble a picture, and I won't show you the details, but we can use this and some statistical guesses to make an estimate of the distribution function. So how many, what is the size distribution, the lateral length of these things look like? And we can put these statistics into a calculation of KVKH, so effective vertical permeability to horizontal permeability ratio. Um, using conservative views of each of these parameters, you come up with a P50 on the order of four ten thousandths. So KVKH ratio of four ten thousandths. Even P90 is eight ten thousandths. And you see the Monte Carlo distribution there, it peaks at three ten thousandths the long tail gets you up to about one and a half thousandths, 15, 10 thousandths, right? This is a really, really low KV cage system. If you go and put this into a reservoir model, which is what we've done, um, thanks to Sahar, you can see the model here. It's one we built for another project. We tried to make it as accurate as possible. And for this, all we did was take out any hint of a regional seal. So you see porosity, permeability, rock type, they all look like Swiss cheese, and they are. It's an accurate view. Um, for this experiment, we'll inject not, not just into Swiss cheese, but into the sandiest part of the Swiss cheese. So you see the perforation in the, the green is deliberately chosen to be up in the sandy upper section. 
And look at what happens when we put CO2 into it. It spreads out along the stratigraphy, right? It takes the easy path. 100 years post-injection, yeah, it moves a bit more as you'd expect it to, but not very far. And it doesn't breach a whole lot of barriers, even though they've got holes all over the place. Mostly it spreads out along stratigraphy and it gets completely arrested well before you exit the side of the model. In 3D, these CO2 plumes look like a stack of pancakes, kind of offset, um, but not very mobile. So composite confinement, highly imperfect barriers, as long as there's a lot of them and they're layered, we can contain CO2 really effectively. Which brings me back to this question about play. We've seen the historical plays, and they're basically petroleum geology repurposed for CCS. And they work, right? There's absolutely nothing wrong with them. But if you're starting from a blank slate, are they what you really want? If you're looking for saline storage, is this the model? And of course, having asked that question, I would say no, right? Based on what we've learned, this is the kind of thing I really like, right? It's the buried hill play or the salt, salt cord anticline. Um, it's low dip. So you've got minimal column heights, minimal buoyancy pressure. Um, a regional seal over the top is nice. It makes permitting easier, but not necessary, as you've seen. What I really like is high quality sands at the point of injection, so I can get the injectivity I need. Off to the left, or off to the right, rather, um, there's an open connection to a large aquifer, so I've got lots of space to dissipate pressure. I use stacked storage, multiple sands to minimize the pressure footprint, the area of review. Um, and as you go up dip, we have a small dip to this, so I know which way CO2 is going to migrate. I would love to see waste zones or sands that pinch out, thin, get more heterogeneous, more complex, and just immobilize more CO2 in waste zones or local capillary trapping, um, poor throat trapping, dissolution, whatever. But immobilized CO2 is exactly that. It's immobilized. And I don't really care about what the seal is. So this is the kind of play I really like. And this is the, the great learning in <laughs> coming to this from petroleum. It's not just a repurposed oil and gas reservoir. It is something unique and fit for purpose. And if we do it well, CO2 is utterly immobilized. We don't have to worry about a thousand years or 10,000 years, because even in 10 years, it's not going anywhere. The last slide I'll show you um, is a thought about the future. And you recognize the map, wells, of course, in the black dot, CO2 sources in yellow, and current storage projects in the blue. They're highly clustered on onshore, right? because basically that's where it's permissible now and because that's where the CO2 sources are. And as we've seen, onshore is going to work. It'll be just fine. But onshore has lots of people, lots of competing uses, um, and ultimately limited storage capacity. I suspect that the future for the really big hubs, the really big developments, is actually offshore, partly for the reasons that Sue and Tip and Ramon have said for years, right? One landowner, fewer NIMBYs, fewer and generally newer wells, but also because you have potentially cheap, really effective pressure management. You can produce water and you can overboard it. And that is transformative if it's allowed for CCS, which looks like it will be, but remains to be seen. So with that, thank you, of course, to the sponsors of the Carbon Center. Thank you, especially to DOE. And for those who want to read more, most of it's been published. So thank you. Five minutes. Yeah, five minutes of questions. Yeah. So, Alex, first of all, congratulations for a really great presentation. You covered a lot of ground and most interesting topics. Um, and especially appreciative of your discussion of passion. That's um, I would challenge you on one aspect. I'm not sure if the frac rate is really the limit. It's the part reactivation. 
Yeah. Special limit, which would be lower. Um, and it's very case, case by case specific because it depends on what orientation and sequence stress field. Um, I would also say that the pressure disturb the, the stress disturbance is larger than the pressure. I don't think it's on. Then um, larger than the the the. the Oh, yeah. Okay, but I'm not to repeat what you just said. That's too much. Um, the the footprint is larger than what you predict with your pressure model, because you only look at flow, but there's the whole elasticity. So, part reactivation. Yep, that's so, the big issue. So, great question. Um, the work is based on my view as an explorer wanting to bracket the range, right? So, this is an absolute best case, and there is a whole uncertainty analysis that I did not show you that considers what if you are limited not by the law, which says 90% frac pressure is your upper bound, but by other factors, for example, fault reactivation, or even worse, by critical pressure, the AOR defining pressure, right, which is a good deal lower. And you're, you're absolutely right. You get a lot less storage capacity. Um, so local results may vary. See store for details, not available in some states. anything online? Yes. Yes, we have one person online. Don, if you can unmute and ask your question. Okay, they may not have a microphone. So Alex, the question is, any ideas on how to resolve potential correlation, correlative rights issues between poor space owners that are defined by OCS lease geometry versus CCS injectors who are or may be defined by a non-rectangular AOR geometry? Oh, boy. Um, the short answer is no, not really. <laughs> um, that is a thorny question, and it's all about policy and, and legal rulings. So, you know, from a subsurface perspective, I say, it is a serious issue. Um, simply raising it and flagging it is progress. Um, but how you resolve it, that is a tough one. I kind of like the idea of a two-tier lease scheme with a high tier for the pore space to be occupied by CO2 and a second tier uh, for the space that you will pressure up. But this is, and it's a sort of temporary lease until the pressure subsides and you could use that same poor space for someone else's injection. But how you actually implement this um, raises all kinds of questions about, you know, how do you determine whose pressure is whose and where it's going and so on and so forth. Um, TBD, I think is the short answer, but good question. Okay, I think I'll thank our audiences online and in the room and uh, then thank Alex for that. A lot of stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Alex is around in case you want to talk more. Always happy to talk about this stuff. And for those online, ping me if you want to talk more. Happy to do so. <laughs>